you turn around and folks are, 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 are saying, you know, I, I'm, being so, it's, I'm being so beaten down during the week. You know, things are coming at me and they're so discouraging. I'm being beaten down. And, and then there's these, this, these lies are just keep coming into my head that I'm stupid and, and I'm never going to get anywhere and all this thing. And that, folks, is spiritual warfare. So we may not want to actually talk about it, but the fact of the matter is that the enemy knows where, where you are. He knows where you live. And he's constantly trying to bring you down and to beat you up and discourage you. And that's really why we're talking about this, so that you don't have to put up with all that stuff. So that's what it's all about, you know. So we've been talking about spiritual warfare, and, and we, talked, um, we, we talked about the different things that we use to fight it. And we're on now a week where I want to start talking about our weapons, in the Lord. I want to talk about our weapons. We talked about discernment. We talked about how to discern what's of the enemy and what's of God. And now we're going to talk about weapons. Weapons is really, really kind of cool and important because there's the angels in heaven, some of them carry bows, some of them carry spears, some of them carry swords, and some of them carry telescopes. Those four things. Why would they have different weapons? Why would they do that? Because different weapons have different things that they're really good at. Some weapons, like a bow, is really good for being very specific. It doesn't broadcast out. It's very specific on what it hits its target and goes for a very long ways. So a bow is a really good thing to have if you want to hit something far away and very accurately. But if you're fighting face-to-face, man-to-man, a bow is the last thing you want to have in your hand. You want to have a sword in your hand. You want to have something that's for hand-to-hand combat. A spear is kind of like a bow. It's a very specific target. It goes a little bit longer, but it hits a lot harder. It's a lot heavier, a lot more forceful. So different weapons have different things. And don't leave out the telescope. The telescope is something that God gave us to enable us to see into a distance and not be distracted by what's around us. It's very important. Seeing is very much a weapon in the spirit to be able to see to have vision, to know where you're going, not be distracted by what's around you. So these are really, really kind of important things. I told you last week or a couple weeks ago, I told you a little story about when I first, one of the first times I ever went out hunting and I hadn't learned how to use my weapon. I chose the cheapest weapon I could possibly buy, this old shotgun. And I went out and and I didn't practice using it. And I shot this deer and this poor deer, I wounded it. And, And I felt terrible and I spent the rest of the day the whole day from 6 a.m. in the morning till dark, chasing after this deer to put it out of its misery. I'm not proud of it that I did it, but, that's, but I learned a real lesson from it. And one of the things that, that I learned throughout the day is as I'm chasing this deer around, following the blood trail, is that oftentimes I would see the deer 100, 120 yards away, and there's nothing I could do about it because my weapon was a short-range weapon. Nothing I could do. So another lesson in the fact that God gives us weapons, he wants us to learn how to use them, And he wants us to know that there's different types of weapons that we use to do these things. So it's really, really kind of important. Um, I also learned that, you know, as it doesn't matter how old you are in the Lord, whether it's day one or you could be 40 years old in the Lord, God continues to teach us how to use our weapons. And uh, this last, this week, it was kind of funny. I didn't talk to Frank or or Mark about it, but Mark came in to visit us this week and... um, I saw Mark talking back with Frank, and if you all know Mark Westinghouse, Mark's always trying to get you. Like he's always trying to say something to you that may not be quite true and see if you believe him. You know, and if you fall for it, you know, then you're like, oh, I fell for that again. I can't believe I did that. So whenever I see Mark, I'm trying to get Mark. So I walked in the back, and I did something. I said something was really stupid. And and they just kind of like, Frank and Mark just kind of like looked at me, you know, almost like, when's he going away? You know, so we, so we can go on with our conversation. So I went back to my office, and, and I was like, wow, that was really stupid. You know, wonder why I did that. And, and, you know, the Holy Spirit started speaking to me, and he said, well, you talk too much. That's his news, not news to you, but see, it was news to me, see. And he, he said, see, you feel like every time you go somewhere or, or with anybody, you have to say something instead of just to be able to just actually not say anything. And because of that, you talk too much. And he said, and he, and he went on to say, because you talk too much, then people start getting used to hearing you. 
And when they get used to hearing you, they may not actually be listening to you like I want them to. He said, so you would be more effective speaker if you didn't talk so much. I was like, wow, you know what? I've been doing this a long time. God is still teaching me. See, God is still teaching me. And you know, sometimes, like, I get so excited about things, i got to say something, right? God said, no, you don't. He said, I want to be able to speak to you. I want to be able to stir your heart, and I want you to learn how to be quiet. I'm like, wow. See, so we never know what God is going to do and how he's going to strengthen these weapons that he gives us. So anyway, let's take a look at weapons really quickly if you can. Weapon number one is probably what you would imagine would be. It's found in Matthew 4, chapter 1, I mean chapter 4, verse 1, and it's the truth. It's God's word. So if you can put that up on the screen, that'd be great. Matthew chapter 4, you should know here, it said in verse 1, Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Now, Up until this point, Jesus, this is the start of Jesus' ministry. This is the very start of his ministry. And up until this point, all we know is that at age 12, he got separated from his parents. They found him in the temple, and he said, well, where, you know, basically in my my language, he's saying, well, where else would you look for me? I got to do my father's work. He's learning at the age of 12 the word of God. He's learning the truth, the things that God has spoken. By the time he's 30 and he's going into the ministry, it says he was led into the wilderness. And it says, verse 2, after he fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. That's a whole other story in itself. Adam gets hungry after about three hours of fasting. Um, But there's there's reason for that, Adam. So, you know. Verse 3, Kurt asked me not to pick on him today, so I'm trying to, you know, use other people. The tempter came to him and said, If you are son of God, command these stones to be bread. But he answered and he said, It's written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then the devil took him into the holy city, and he had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, If you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written. Please take note. Underline that right there. The devil is quoting scripture to Jesus. He says, it is written, he will give his angels charge concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. But Jesus said to him, on the other hand, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Hmm. Verse 8, again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and serve him only, and the devil left him. So you can see that here the first attack that Jesus comes under, he uses the word of God as his weapon to make the enemy leave. I also want to take note for anybody who's really into it, Jesus never cursed the enemy. He didn't do anything like, I take command over you. He simply preaches the word of God to the enemy, and he leaves. That's simple. That's how powerful this weapon is. That's how powerful it is. When I first when in, I first got saved, simply by listening to the word being preached, simply by going to a Bible study. It wasn't even in church. I went to a Bible study. The, the leader of the Bible study was basically just teaching the truth, and I got saved by it. The truth was that powerful in me, and when, and, when, and when it had that effect on me, I figured, you know what? I'm going to learn how to do this with other people. So Linda and I started counseling people. We didn't, we didn't have any counseling training. We didn't have any degrees in it. And we quickly found out that we really don't know what we're doing. We quickly found out people had problems that we didn't have the answers to. The answers were in here. Don't get me wrong. It's just that we needed to learn how to use it better. We needed to learn it. We needed to learn how to use it. And so it was really, really important. So that the word of God by itself is a powerful, powerful weapon. I also want to just take time to say that when I say the Word of God, I'm talking about the Word of God. I'm not talking about Christianese. How many people know what Christianese is? All these words that we use and these phrases that we use that people in the world look at us like, wow, they are just from another planet. You know, it's really true. We use all these words. We throw them around at people. They have no, we, we have these phrases. You know, I, I told you many times that people started talking about being saved. I didn't know what that meant. The first meeting I went to, people were getting up and saying, well, I got saved here and I got saved. And I said, oh, I get it. This is a group of people 
who had a near-death experience. They were pulled out of a fire or a fire, you know, maybe they, 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 they stalled on the railroad tracks and somebody saved them. I didn't even know what they were talking about. We throw these words out like they're, like they're nothing. We say, you know, we talk about, um, well, you know, they'll see the light. And people are like, well, you know, is that a flashlight? Uh, you know, is, what kind of light are you talking about? We talk about the blood. Well, you know, you just need to claim the blood. Excuse me? Am I in a lab somewhere? I, what, you know, people look at us like strange. Folks, just use the word of God as it is. Talk, talk in plain English as it is. It's, the word of God is all you need. And skip the, skip the phrases in the, in the Christianese. It's such an, an important, profound weapon. And it's so profound and important, going back to that verse we read, that the enemy will use it if he uses it to give you half of a truth. If he uses it to spin it in such a way to make you think something that's, that's not true by itself. There's, I, I actually chuckle and get such a kick out of the way we all spin things. I saw a commercial the other day. This, this, this jewelry place was saying that they're going to sell jewelry at a fraction of the cost that it normally is. Everybody said, well, I want one. I, a watch, it's a $100 watch. I'm going to sell it to you a fraction of the cost. That's great. How much is it going to cost me? $99. You said a fraction of the cost. Well, 99 is 99 one hundredths of a fraction of one. It's, it is a fraction of the cost. It's just almost the whole thing. That's what we do. A fraction of the cost doesn't mean anything to me. I told you last week about the commercial on TV that this pill, you take this pill, it's going to make you lose the, of all the 100% of the weight you lose, 78% of it is going to be body fat. I'm like, that's really scary because what's the other 22%? Nothing that I want to lose. Maybe it's brains. I can't think of anything in the body besides fat that I want to lose. It's scary. I read something, I read something just yesterday. This celebrity said that Jesus is not against homosexuality because he never once condemned it. He never said anything against homosexuality. And I'm like, wow, what a spin. That's great. Honey, what's for dinner? She says, we're going to have lasagna. Okay, well, she didn't say we weren't going to have chicken, so maybe we'll have chicken too. Can you imagine if she has to go around saying everything she's not going to have so that I'll make sure that I know what we're going to have? That's the logic here. Jesus went on in many scriptures to tell what marriage was. And every time he spoke about marriage, he talked about being between a man and a woman. It, and the, and the, the whole analogy of Jesus coming back is the bridegroom coming back for the bride. Everything that he mentioned goes from the beginning in Genesis. It talks about a man and a woman. He didn't have to come against it. He didn't come against pot either. Does it make it right? It's the way the enemy spins it. And then there's so many divisions in the body of Christ from people spinning things. Jesus said in one scripture, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So they take one scripture, that means that there is no, there is no three, there's no Father, there's no Son, there's no Holy Spirit. They're all the same because of that one scripture. And then later on, he said, he said, he said things like, he was hanging on the cross, he said, God, why, are you, why have you forsaken me? And he said, when I go, it's going to be better for you when I go because then I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. But let's just take one scripture. And let's just use that, and let's see if we can steer you wrong. Let's see if we can do that. Then the enemy comes along with non-scriptures, and he says things to you like, you know what, you're really stupid. Come on, how many people have been, have been you know, really had the enemy whispers things in their ear like that? And you can come back with the word of God. God has given me wisdom. Wisdom comes from above. I don't need to be an Einstein to have a wisdom of God. I love, I love this little lie. Then the enemy comes along sometimes after telling you you're no good and you're stupid. Then he tells you the opposite, so you know you are worthy. I'm like, no, you're not. I'm not worthy. You're not worthy. God chose us, redeemed us. And that's what the blood of Christ is all about. Making us his children. It's really, really cool. The truth is, is our word, and it's our number one rep weapon. Why wouldn't we want more of it? Number two weapon, number two, if you're writing these down, is wisdom. Besides the truth, 
You need wisdom on how to apply it. You need wisdom on how to apply it. I want to tell you a little, quick little funny story. We're up the cabin years ago, maybe 15 years ago or so, and, and, and a friend of mine came up and he had a bunch of fireworks. And he had those fireworks, you know, that like, I don't know what they're M80s or whatever they are, but they, you put them on a stick and you light them and they shoot off into the air. You know, they're like a little rocket. What? Bottle rocket? Sounds like Roman candles. Put it on my dock. I'm on shorts. Of course, it's hot, summertime. Put it on the dock, lit it, stood back. Hmm, it's not doing anything. Now, I know that they're dangerous. So I have that truth. I know that they propel. That's why we bought it. And I know that once you light them, they're even more dangerous. <laughs> that didn't give me the wisdom to not do anything about it. So I walked over to it, stood in front of it to see what's going on with this thing, reached down to relight it, when all of a sudden I noticed, Psh, it's on. I turned around, boom, it went right into the back of my calf muscle and propelled itself, burning itself into it, right down to the muscle, right down to the muscle. You gotta, you gotta love Linda. Here's the kind of questions she asks me whenever I do something. She says, why did you do that? <laughs> or her other famous one is, what are you doing? I'm sitting here letting this rocket burn into my leg. Thank you. That's in case you didn't notice. <laughs> in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, Paul writes to Timothy about the word of God, and he said, he basically said in my language, it's your responsibility to rightly divide the word of truth. To rightly divide it. That doesn't mean divide it in a bad way. It's to rightly put it together so that you have a balanced thing that you know what God is saying. It takes wisdom to do that. That's what it's all about. Pray for wisdom. Too many Christians are walking around without wisdom, with the truth, and are throwing bottle rockets at each other. <laughs> Weapon number three. Weapon number three is love. Love is a powerful weapon. And again, with the truth, in Ephesians 4.15, it says that we are speaking the truth in love. And I'm telling you, I've seen, I've seen this, I've done it myself, speak the truth without love can actually be damaging. But love is a very, very powerful weapon and has dramatic effects. Proverbs says that, is that um, you can turn away wrath with a gentle answer, with love. Somebody can be angry at you, and you show them love and kindness, and the anger just dissipates out of them. It's amazing. God's love is, is an amazing thing. Romans 2, verse 4, is one of my favorite verses in the entire book. It said, it is the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. It's his kindness, his love, that leads us to repentance. God uses his love as a weapon in our lives. It's really, really great. Sometimes I have to stop myself and ask myself, why am I saying what I'm doing? Do I want to set them straight? <laughs> or do I want God to have his way? Why am I saying it? Okay, weapon number four. This one would be a little bit of a surprise to you might not see it coming. But weapon four is commitment. Weapon four is obedience, commitment. It's, it's simply put, it's actually doing what God wants you to do. It's a very powerful weapon. It's a very powerful weapon. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make up this little story about JJ. This is not a true story. So she wants you to know that. I'm making this up. But, but this, is what, this is what came to me, and I just think it is such a great way of demonstrating this. But I would say to JJ, she's 10 years old, JJ, go and clean up your room. And two hours later, you can see your room's not clean. So I'm like, JJ, I told you to go and clean up your room. And she comes back and she says, but I memorized it. Memorize what you said. Go clean up your room. I, I'm like, but... Not only did I memorize it, but I learned it in the Greek. I can actually repeat what you said word for word and in the Greek. And next week, 
we're gonna, I'm getting my friends over and we're going to study about it. We're going to study all about cleaning up my room. It's so exciting. And then we're going to draw up some plans on how to get things into certain things and type and put them, organize them in this. And we're going to plan this whole thing out so that we'll know what to do when we ever decide to do it. Jesus said, go and make disciples. I'm going to memorize that scripture. I'm going to learn it in the Greek. I'm going to plan on it. I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to figure out where we're going to put all the people when we, get, when we make these disciples. I'm going to know everything there is to know about it. It's just that when I go home, I'm just going to turn on TV and not do anything all day. Doing what God said is all as important as all the other things together. Doing it. Because when the enemy sees you doing it, now he's got a foe a formidable foe that he respects and fears. And we want to talk about spiritual warfare. We want to talk about people who get afraid of it. The enemy is afraid of any of us that actually do what God tells you to do. And I'm, I'm just going to, I'm going to, we're going to have a show, we're going to show a video. But also I just want to say that, you know, the, the one that really stuck to me one time years ago, no, he knows. He's, he's playing with it. He's ready for the video. He did get a, he did a Mark Westinghouse on him. He made Adam think he wasn't ready for the video. <laughs> he fell for it. There's a fine line between doing that and lying, you know. Just want to let you know that. So anyway, um, what was I saying? Uh. Oh, being afraid. I, I told this story once years ago, but I got into this airplane by myself, and I, we were, I was heading, and it was five years ago, because JJ was pregnant with the twins, and Lynn and I were supposed to go to St. Thomas with this, with this printing organization who uses it as an excuse to go to the Caribbean in the wintertime. I thought I had to go, so, but she doesn't want to go because the twins are going to be born, so I end up being on this plane from, at JFK by myself, getting on this plane to go to St. Thomas. And I get into the plane, and I'm about five rows back, from the front, and I can see the door where people, where we just came in, came in, I sat down, and could see the door, and, and I got, I don't, I don't know why people want to get on the plane first, I don't like being on planes at all, so I want to get on last, and get off first, that was what I prefer to do, so I, I got on really late, and, and as I sat down, I got comfortable, and I look, and I see a couple more people are coming in, this young man comes in the door, young man comes through the door, he takes two steps, he looks up and he looks right at me, and he stares at me, and he stops. He just stares at me. And I'm like, why is he staring at me? I have no idea why he's staring at me. And I mean, this is like for 10 seconds, he's like just staring at me. Then he turned around to the stewardess, and he said, I want off the plane. I want off this plane right now. She goes, I already shut the door. I can't, I got to call the captain. He goes, call, call the captain. The captain came out end up opening the door and let this guy off the plane. He looked at me and he wanted off the plane. I don't know what happened. I don't know. Maybe he thought I was the U.S. Air Marshal or something. I don't know. I don't know what happened, but I do know what happened. In his spirit, there's something was going on. And even though I was completely ignorant of what was going on and completely just resting and relaxing, the enemy was afraid of me. Me, just a little me. What do I, what, what do I, that's what it's going to be like. That's what it is like for all of you. The enemy is afraid of you when you're serious about the things of God. He's afraid of you. Sure, he's going to try to attack you, but he's got nothing. He's got no ability to bite you. He says he goes about like a roaring lion, seeking who to devour. He'll growl. He'll hiss. He'll try everything he can do, but he's got no power over you. You can stand in front of the roaring lion and just laugh. Like, you're kind of funny, but actually you're annoying, so good, go away. You know, that's what it's like. Go and make disciples. Doing what God wants us to do makes us strong and mightier. And I want to show this video about a woman that actually did. She didn't memorize the verse. She actually went and made a disciple. I want to show you what that's like. If you hit those lights...
This is Nate. Nate became a Christ follower two weeks ago and is still a bit giddy about it. Now he's trying not to do cartwheels in public. Nate became a believer partly because of Kim. Yet oddly enough, Kim and Nate have never met. Now is this possible? Well, let's take a look. Kim loved Jesus from an early age, and in college she had a huge impact on her friends. While most of her peers used their college years to, well, experiment, Kim didn't. She remained committed to her faith, and it showed. It especially showed to Lisa, her roommate, who confessed to Kim that she wanted whatever it was that made Kim so strong. Kim shared her faith with Lisa, and Lisa believed. Years later, at Lisa's first real job, she met Thomas. Thomas was hit by a drunk driver when he was 13 and still carried a lot of anger and bitterness. Thomas and Lisa became friends, and it wasn't long before he started going to church with Lisa and her husband. After a lot of studying and searching, Thomas gave his life to Christ. Fast forward a few years. Thomas became a public speaker and was often asked to speak at large events. See, when he became a believer, Thomas developed a new perspective on life. He stopped resenting what had been taken from him and started being thankful for the second chance he had been given. On one particular day, Thomas shared about overcoming hardship and what it means to choose joy. He was so passionate that a number of people were inspired to share a link to his video. The video of Thomas inspired James, too. And if anyone needed inspiration, it was him. James had a ton of issues. He spent most of his life as a passive husband, an absent father, and a horrible friend. That said, no one disliked him more than he disliked himself. But everything changed the night he happened to watch Thomas online. Something clicked and he knew what he had to do. He surrendered his miserable life to someone greater, and he was forever changed. James fought hard to make up for the lost years with his family. And he also began working with young men who were in danger of throwing their lives away. One of those men was Nate. Nate didn't really know his own dad, and he had no real direction in life, ultimately bouncing from one bad decision to another. Because of that, he often found himself in trouble with the law. No one had ever showed him what it looked like to be a real man. That is, until he met James. James became the first father figure Nate ever had. He learned about honesty, self-control, humility, and integrity, and where those traits come from. Two months later, Nate publicly declared his belief in Christ. And of course, James was there. Now you can see the connection. Nate was impacted by James, who was influenced by Thomas. Thomas saw an uncommon joy in Lisa, who learned of Jesus from Kim. Kim's relationship with God eventually led to Nate's. Funny how these two people have never met and never will. We are in exciting times. So I just want to encourage you to grab your weapon. And some of us already know what our weapon are, weapons are. Um, I grabbed one of my old weapons out of the closet last year, and I found it was all rusty. Needed some cleaning and oiling. Jay's laughing, because he knows that half the times I go out with him, my gun doesn't work. And that's the way oftentimes we are as Christians. We're like, oh yeah, God wants me to have a weapon. He wants it to work. Get it out. Clean it. Oil it. Learn it. Because we're not going to just study about making disciples. Um, here at Family of Hope, we're going to get really serious about it. And um, we need everybody to do it.